Look at this Bible I just got. 15 bucks. And talk about a preachy book. Everybody's a sinner, except for this guy. Everybody's a sinner, except for this guy. That's pretty much the message that you're going to hear today in the passage that we're looking at. Um, when people talk and complain about the Bible being a preachy book, where everyone's called a sinner, they're actually talking about pretty much the passage we're going to look at today. So I want to give you that heads up. Um, my name is Jared. If I have I met most of you, but I haven't met all of you. My name is Jared. I belong to Jesus Christ. That's what I'm hoping to live out. My hope and prayer is that uh, I could help you in some way know Jesus and follow him. That's the, the hope and purpose of, of what we're doing here. We want to help people uh, draw closer to the presence of God. We want to build one another up and help each other grow in love for God and love for one another. And we want to be a people that leave here that go and show and tell the good news of Jesus. Why do we want to do that? Quite simple. We believe Jesus is good and glorious. And we're made, I believe that about every single one of you, we are all made to participate in the glory and the goodness of God. I hope you get that today. I hope we can bless you and help you understand that in some way today. And we are studying part of this uh, Bible, right? We're studying this letter to the church in Rome from 2,000 years ago. We're studying this book because it teaches us some truths that transform lives. Uh, this book talks about the glory and goodness of God. It talks about the good news of Jesus. It's, it's a book written by a man named Paul to a, a group of people that were learning to follow Jesus. Jews and Christians normally didn't get along, but now coming together, and, and the truth in this letter transforms some of their lives. And it's been a letter that's had truth that transforms for 2,000 years across all different types of cultures. We believe it's worthy of our focus and our time. So we're coming together and studying this book. We study it in, in this time now together. And then also about 60 of us are in something called Realize Gatherings throughout the week where we look at this passage again and we, we study it to find more and more truth about God and more and more truth about ourselves. We, we come under it. It's part of our sacred scripture. We, we see it as an authority in our lives that we submit to. Now, authority and submit, those are not popular terms in our culture, right? The truth is, though, anything that influences you, anything that you trust, anything that you go to for wisdom or knowledge is an authority in your life, be it parents or peers or TikTok or YouTube um, or, or news broadcasts or social media sites or, or internet news uh, or celebrities. Whatever you go to, whatever you put some trust in, is your authority. It has authority, and you kind of submit to that authority. We believe Romans has truths that it teaches us about God and about ourselves, and we're looking to it as an authority. You might be suspicious of that. That's okay. Listen to what we're going to teach today, and you can decide for yourself. Now, I want to mention something else before we begin. It is okay if your brain wanders in and out while I'm speaking today. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? It's okay. Some of you are nodding your heads very vigorously, so you're, so you're paying attention so far. I appreciate that. Uh, I, uh, first, Romans is a dense and challenging book, and I am not the most interesting man in the world. Not me. <laughs> we got the next slide. So you can see, that's me, that's not me. The most interesting thing about me isn't even about me. The most interesting thing about me is that my wife is able to have multiple children at one time. This is my most liked picture on social media ever, because I'm holding two newborns. I am not the most interesting man in the world. Every teenager in this room has a bedtime several hours past when I go to bed. If we had a night service, I'd be up here in a rocking chair underneath a weighted blanket, okay? If your mind wanders a bit in and out, that is okay. But I'm asking you 
when we get to the last section of this message, to refocus. Because as your mind goes in and out, and as we work through some of this dense but important stuff with really challenging and good truth in it, as we look through this, at the end, we're going to have a chance to act on the truth that we hear and look at today. And that word act is an acronym. It means apply, change, and tell. We're going to have an opportunity to think about what we learned today and think about how we could apply it to our lives. Or uh, look at our hearts and think about what what change we might make with our hearts based on what what we've learned or what we see or what's revealed today. And then tell. We have the opportunity to go and tell someone something good from what we hear today. So don't miss that. The goal of this message is not that you remember everything I say. That's not the goal. The goal is not that you feel good about what I say, right? The goal, the the big win for all of us would be if if some truth of God is revealed and we act on it. So don't miss that. If you hate everything I have to say or fall asleep for most of this message, but grab hold of something really good that God uses here and then start living it out, that would be a thousand times better than if you stay awake the whole time and say, Pastor, that was great, but then nothing happens or nothing changes, okay? Okay? So you have permission for your mind to wander, and the goal, though, is that we act. All right, so let's dive into this text and see if there is some truth that transforms. We are in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 to 20. Paul begins the letter and says, hi. We got a picture of Paul saying hi to us. Everyone can wave to Paul and say hi, right? Fun fact, I learned how to use shapes on PowerPoint this week, so I'm really finding my calling. There might be a message where I just explain how to use PowerPoint for everyone, because You can see how gifted I am at that. Um, Paul says, hi, I belong to Jesus Christ, and I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel. And we're going to be in 3, 9 to 20, but i got to give you just some, some, some flow of where Paul is in this letter so we're up to date. Paul begins this letter and says, hi, I'm Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I belong to Jesus. I believe there's good news about Jesus that's powerful for salvation. For all who would believe it. He says this gospel is for everyone. It's for the nations. Paul hopes that all kinds of people would come to know and believe and trust in Jesus. And then, starting about halfway through chapter 1, Paul talks about what keeps us from God and, and the good news of Jesus. Paul talks about this plague of something in this world called sin. And Paul says, hey, we were actually made to glorify God. You were made to participate in this glory of God, connect with the glory of God, live in this glory of God. But there's this thing called sin that is a plague on us. We, we have turned away from God. We, instead of worshiping and glorifying God, we've worshiped and glorified created things. And we've exchanged the truth of God for lies. And the nations, all these nations that aren't Israel, which is kind of God's chosen people, right? These other nations have all started committing all of these different sins that pull them away from the way of God. And not only that, but some of the moral people, the people that say, hey, I know those things are sins, they're extra judgmental towards the people that that commit those sins. And and worse than that, this plague of sin also impacts these people, Israel. God has tried to reveal, God has revealed his law to his people, Israel, saying, here's the way to live. And in fact, I want you to be a light to all of the nations so the nations can come back to my glory. Everyone should know about me through my creation, but they don't. They've turned away. But Israel, here's, here's the law. Here's the way to God. Be a light to others. And this Israel also turns from God. They also, they condemn the sins of others, but they also, if they look deep down, end up committing some of the same sins. So that the situation that Paul unpacks in this letter is there's this Jesus who has the power of God for salvation. We're all made to know and glorify God, but uh, people are, are turned from God and they've turned to all kinds of sins that keep them from the glory they're made for. And through all of this, Paul's declaring that God is righteous, And that's a big word that we're going to see just about every week. God is righteous. That means he's both just and and hates the sin and evil that corrupts his world, but he's also faithful and loyal and loving and merciful. And this this God who's righteous is going to uh, unleash his wrath against all of this sin and evil that robs the glory of this creation. But he's also this kind and patient God, waiting and withholding, hoping for people to repent and come back to him. 
And that brings us to three verses 9 to 20, which we're hopping into today. And I'm going to dive right in here. And you can pull out a Bible in your pew or pull it up on your phone, and we're going to have the text on the screen. And this is Paul finishing his argument uh, for this problem of sin. And he says this in verse 9, what then are we any better off? And he's talking specifically to the Jews, and Paul is one of them. He's saying, what about us who have the law? Are we any better off than these Gentiles who are sinners? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks, or Jews and all of the nations, are under sin. And he quotes his his sacred scriptures. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Talk about a preachy book. Everyone's a sinner, right? Are some people righteous? Are some people not sinners? No, all, all are unrighteous, all are sinners. And it's not just that people sin. It's not just that we're made for glory and that people sin. That that, that word sin, it's originally an an archery term. It means to miss the mark. So you draw your bow, you're aiming for something, you're aiming for this good way of God, you're aiming for God's glory, and you miss. You sin, you miss the mark. It's not just that we commit sins. It's that we're under this power of sin. In Paul's understanding, the way Paul sees the world, it's, that, it's not that people just commit some sins occasionally. It's that we're under the power, under the reign, under the dominion of sin. God made us to be under his glory. God made us to be crowned with his glory. And instead, sin has come in. And the way Paul sees sin is that sin has become this active, living thing that has power, that reigns over us, that, that crowns us with sin. Paul will use phrases like, we are slaves to sin. Or he'll use a phrase like, sin seizes an opportunity in me. In in the scriptures, in the story of Cain and Abel, uh, the the brother Cain who ends up uh, killing his brother Abel, the first kind of murder in the Bible, God comes to Cain and says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to master you. This force of sin It's not just that we commit sins or we do the wrong thing once in a while. It's that sin has taken on this life of its own and we're stuck under its power. In verses 11 to 18, Paul unpacks kind of how comprehensive this reign is. And as I work through these verses, think through, he's going to hit the different parts of what it means to be human and different body parts and different actions. And, And look at this. Verse 11, he says, There is no one who understands... There is no one who seeks God. We are made to know God. God made us in his image and his likeness to know him, to be in communion with him. We're made to to seek God. But the mind is now under the power of sin. The eyes now have this cataract of sin that keeps us from seeing God the way we're meant to see him. Consider your own life, right? Is your life a life where your mind is thinking about the glory of God and how to connect with God in your life? Or does your mind get captivated by other things? Even sometimes when you know those things aren't good for you, does your mind get captured by other things? Or or what about what you seek, what you put your eyes on? Are there times even when you know, you know what you're seeking isn't good, but you can't stop seeking it anyway, right? Right? There's no one who understands because of this power of sin. There's no one who's really seeking faithfully and setting their eyes on God. Even though we, even though we know sometimes that it's not good what we're doing, we can't help ourselves. Verses 12, and then I'm jumping down to 15 and 16. So the mind is under the power of sin. 12, all have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. How about those feet and those actions? Paul goes from the mind and the eyes to the feet and the actions. Where do our feet go? Are they always running to do more and more good that God has for us? Are we always putting those hands to good work to build this world up for, to bring about God's healing purposes in the world? Well, look at the world around us, right, that we're a part of. No, 
the feet have turned from God and they've turned to violence, and turned to bloodshed, and turned to wretched things. There's that word worthless in there. It's such a negative, awful word, right? It's not a lot of positive self-talk there, right? That word worthless. But it's really important to think about. It's not that we're worthless. We're made to be so full of worth and purpose and God's glory. You're so valuable to God. You're worth so much. And the power of sin strips that from you. It chips away at your worth and your value. You're made to be in this glory of God and when your feet turn to sin, sin grabs hold of you and it strips your worth and your value and at the end, it leaves you worthless. We're made for this infinite God-given worth. And when we come under the power of sin, it strips all of that away until we end up worthless. Verse 13, what about our mouth? Their throat under the power of sin is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. God gave us mouths and tongues. We spent time worshiping God today. We were given this voice to use for good to speak words of life into each other's life, to glorify and praise the God who created us. What a wonderful gift God has given us to communicate. So we only use our words for good things then, right? No. In another part of the scriptures, James, the half-brother of Jesus, hits this. He says, no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison, right? should be so easy. You don't have something nice to say. Don't say anything at all. All you have to do is stop talking sometimes. But we can't. We don't have control over our own mouths sometimes. Has anyone's mouth ever gotten them in trouble? With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. The mouth is corrupted by sin. 17 and 18, the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. That's what the the scriptures, the Old Testament, say over and over again. The fear of God, the beginning of all wisdom. And that's not that we're just in abject horror and terror of God all the time. It would make sense to be afraid or fearful of the living God, the one who created you, the one who is is almighty and all-powerful. But this fear, it means this, this awe. You should be overwhelmed by the awe and glory of God, this healthy, respectful fear. But the power of sin somehow pulls us into this arrogance, into this brokenness that we don't fear God anymore. We don't live as if there's a just God who cares about right and wrong and will hold the world accountable for it one day. We don't live that way. Think about it. Like, I fear the laws in this country. There's some things I don't do that I'd probably like to do, or I'd say I wouldn't want to do it, but push came to shove, I might do some bad things if I knew the punishment wasn't that great, right? We know stealing's wrong. If the penalty for stealing was like one night in town jail and then like 20 hours of community service, more people would steal, right? If you were going to jail for like five years for stealing something, or you're going to jail for one day for stealing something, You might be like, oh, I really want that awesome thing, you know, or this might be, I might steal this big car or something. If I get caught, what happens, right? We would fear the government less, right? We operate as if we don't fear God. If if God says his wrath's coming against sin, if God made us for glory and is is, 
against and opposed, and if God's more just and mighty and powerful than any human government, but we don't live as if that's true, it's because sin has corrupted us to such a way that we don't fear this God. So Paul lays this all out in 11 to 18. Um, Sin has taken all of us, all parts of us have been busted up by this sin. And then verses 19 to 20, and this is a little confusing, but, but stay with me. He, he talks specifically to the people who have this law, this, this, this law of God, the Jews. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world might become subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. Here's what Paul's saying here. Everyone is under this power of sin. The law was given to some people. The law was given to Israel. This law talks about the way to God, the way to live, the way God would, would, wants his world to be ordered again. You see things like the Ten Commandments and, and other good laws that would be good for all of us to live by. This law was given to be shared with the whole world. So that, and one result of that would be the whole world would recognize and understand that we're in sin. This law was given. One of the benefits of this law is it actually shows us that we're made for God's glory and God's way and that we're unable to, that we're trapped in this power of sin. One thing that sinners have done with that law is we've decided, hey, since we have that law, since we have this special relationship where God made a covenant with us, we can be justified and set right because we're special people who have those special things. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Having the law, knowing the law, knowing what sin is, doesn't justify you. It doesn't solve the problem. You're still under sin. And this is a a real problem for religious folks like us today, folks who grew up in the church, folks who have the church, right? One problem for Israel is uh, some of them uh, might have said, hey, Well, yeah, those pagans, those people out there who do all these sins that we don't do, they're in trouble. But we have God's law. We have this thing called circumcision. We have this this covenant God made with us. And Paul's saying, no, no, no. None of that will fix it. None of that will set you right with God. And many of us have grown up in churches today, and we might say, hey, we have this thing called communion. Hey, we have more than the law. We got the whole Bible. And I know the Bible, and I read the Bible. Hey, we got the baptism waters. Hey, we got church membership. Hey, I grew up in the church. And Paul's word to us would be like, those are all good things to help you follow God, to help you know God, to point you to God. But they won't justify you. They don't set you right. Hey, I got the letter to Romans. I love reading Romans. That means I'm justified and I'm good and I'm not, I don't have to deal with sin anymore. No. Romans, if you study it and know it, it's going to say, there's sin. There's a problem. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. Talk about a preachy book. Everyone's a sinner. Everyone's trapped in this problem that keeps us from the glory of God. I don't want to leave us here. This is a dark spot. I'm going to go into the next few verses, and Pastor C is going to unpack them more next week. But in our sin, here's what we're like. They did this experiment with rats years ago. And this is a terrible experiment, but they did it, so I'm going to tell you about it. They took some rats, and they put them in a bucket, and they put them in a bucket full of water and left them in total, total darkness. And they saw how long they would live. They swam for about three minutes on average, and then they drowned. That's what we're like in sin. We're trying to swim and survive in total darkness. Then they did something else. They took those same rats, well, those rats were gone. They took some new rats, they put them in the bucket, and they put a glimmer of light, a ray of light that the rats could see so they could see just a little bit of light. Those rats lasted for 36 hours. From three minutes to 36 hours. The sin is like swimming in the dark. But verse 21 gives two words. But now. But now. 
for everyone who is trapped in sin, and that's all of us, everyone who's broken by sin, everyone who's had its worth stripped from sin, there is a but now. There is news that Paul has for the Romans and news and truth about God that's transformed people for 2,000 years. And I want to share those words with you. But now, verse 21, but now apart from the law, apart from being justified by God's law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. And this is attested to, the law and the prophets have been pointing to this. There is a righteous God and his light is shining in on those who are in sin. This ray of light gives hope. There is a righteous God. And what does that righteous God mean? I keep coming back to this word. That means, yes, he's going to judge and he's going to fight and he's going to destroy evil and sin. But righteousness also means that he's just and that he's merciful and that he's patient and kind and he's full of steadfast, loyal love. So how do we see that righteousness? How is that righteousness being revealed? The next verse gets at that. The righteousness of God is through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So we're going to see that this righteous God proves he's righteous, proves he hasn't given up on humanity through his son Jesus Christ, and this Jesus is faithful. So how is this Jesus? What does this Jesus do? I'm going to read the next section. It's a lot. I'm going to summarize it. Steve's going to unpack it a lot more next week, but I need you to hear it. The righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Christ to all who believe, since there's no distinction, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? All of us fall short of that glory. That's what he just said in three. They are justified. They're set right with God freely by his grace. It's God's choice, not ours. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Jesus as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. There's a lot in there. Here's what Paul's saying. God is righteous. He shows that through Jesus. Here is what Jesus has done for all of us who sin and fall short of the glory of God. This righteous God has put Jesus forward as this sacrifice on the mercy seat. And there's uh, this whole tradition in Israel of, of sacrifice for sins to, to atone for, to cover the sins of the people of God. Jesus is this sacrifice. He dies on the cross to pay the penalty for sins. The righteous God is going to uh, destroy the power of sin. And Jesus takes on the sin. The humans who are under the power of sin, Jesus' sacrifice redeems them. It buys them back from the power of sin. This is an act that the righteous God chooses to do freely. It is his gracious choice for us under the power of sin to send Jesus. And it's Jesus' gracious choice towards us to become sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we can be justified, so that we can have the righteousness of God. Nothing else justifies us. Nothing else sets us right. We're made for that glory. We're trapped under the power of sin. And God stays righteous. God stays faithful. When we're unfaithful, he's faithful. And he proves his love for us. While we're these sinners, Christ dies for us. And it's the power of his work on the cross that redeems us, that can pull us from the worthlessness of sin and pull us back into worth and glory. And this is quite simply for all who believe. For all of those trapped in sin, for all of us under the burden of sin, for all of us swimming in sin, we can turn, we can repent. We turn to Jesus and say, I used to be under the power of sin, but I believe the power of Jesus is greater than the power of sin. And we look to Jesus and say, I'm gonna place my faith in Jesus. I'm repenting from the sin in my life, and I'm turning to Jesus. I believe his work on the cross is able to overcome the power of sin in my life. I look to him now as my Lord and Savior and King. I don't wanna be a slave to sin any longer. And when we do that, when we place our faith in Christ, 
what we find is the salvation, the redemption that's in him. We are saved from that power of sin in our lives, from the penalty that sin will ultimately bring us. As we move into life with Christ, we, we, we move away from the presence of that sin and we move towards the glory and goodness of God again. And this, this work of Christ comes with the giving of his spirit so that God's spirit is given to us so that we can have renewed hearts, renewed minds, circumcised heart is how Paul puts it, so that we can move forward into the glory and goodness of God. Everyone's a sinner except this guy. Put your faith in him. I said if your mind wandered a bit, that's okay. I said refocus at the end because you'll have an opportunity to act. I'm going to do that now. I want to talk about some ways we can act on what we've learned and what we've heard today. If we just hear some truths but don't do anything, then, then we've, we've missed something. We've missed an opportunity. This letter wasn't written so that people could read it or just read it once in a while, hear about it, hear a talk on Sunday, and then go on with their lives. There's a chance for us to apply something good in this message today. There's a chance for us to change in some way. There's a chance for us to go and tell others some good things today. So I want to share with you a few ways we can act on what we've heard today. First, apply. Would you tap your heads for me? Tap your heads. Come on. All right. Thank you. You can tap someone else's head if you want. I know it's silly, but you, some of you did it. That's good. You'll remember. There's some things we can apply to not just be hearers of this word, but doers. Here are three things. Here are three truths from this passage that I want to keep with me that I think would be good if you kept with you as well. And if you could remember just some of this and apply just some of this, that would be so good. One, sin ruins everything under its power. Sin ruins people. It ruins relationships. It ruins nations. It ruins churches. It ruins me. This sin is a foreign agent that is anti-creation, pro-chaos, pro-death. That's a truth we need to apply to know how bad sin is in this world. That's one. Two, the gospel declares that the power of Jesus is greater than the power of sin. As great and powerful as sin feels in our lives and, and as we see the ramifications of sin all over this broken world, this chapter, this letter proclaims that the righteousness of God, the power of Jesus Christ, is always greater than the power of sin. That's two. I want to figure out how to live that and apply that in my life. Three, if I stay under the reign of sin, the end result is I will be worthless. If I stay under the power of sin, I will waste my life and end up living a life that's worthless. But if I come under the reign of Christ, I will have infinite worth and glory. I gotta figure out how to apply that truth. I, I hope you do too. If you would remember some of the, these truths and apply them, imagine what could happen. Imagine the lives we could be living. Change. And tap your heart. Would you tap your heart with me? All right, a few of you would, thank you. In, in the Bible, uh, the heart isn't just emotional feelings. It's, it's the change decision. It's, it's your will that makes changes. These words were written so that uh, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. Paul proclaims these message, this message, this letter, so that people's hearts would be changed. Here's a few things I, I want to change after hearing this message, and you could think about changing as well. One, I, I want to choose to be more sensitive to sin in my life. If sin really is this deadly and this powerful, then I don't want to be living in sin any longer. So I, I want to be more sensitive to sin and how it impacts me and my whole body. Here's a real simple way we could do this. You could take five minutes at the end of your day and think through what you did with your day. What did you do with your mind? What did you do with your eyes? What did you do with your feet? What did you do with your heart? What actions did you take? 
And just ask God to be sensitive. Say, hey, God, I'm trying to follow you. I, I believe in you. I, I love you. I, I, I believe you've given me your spirit. You, you've saved me from sin and death. I'm still stuck in some of this, Lord. And go through your day. You could take five minutes and do that. And let God, ask God to show you where there's sin in your life. And then you can confess that to him. You can do that. That would be good. That would help us. That would help us change. That would help us get away from some of the sin and destructive things in our lives. And you could confess that to God, and then you could spend a few minutes just asking God, God, move me. Move me from this power of sin that makes life so worthless. Move me towards your glory. Lord, you have the Holy Spirit. Move, move that spirit in me. Help me. Help my church community. Help us move from sin. Help us move towards glory. That's a change we could choose to make. A second change I'd love to make, and you could choose to make, is to commit to taking some time each day to praise and glorify God more. I've been trying to do this. We have a few psalms. Uh, we read it this morning in our prayer time before, before the service started. Uh, we read Psalm 34 regularly and Psalm 8 and Psalm 24 regularly and some psalms right around 100. And I need it because I need to be reminded of the glory and goodness of God. If I'm made to glorify God, if I'm made to participate in God's glory, then uh, to move away from sin, I can start putting that rhythm in my life. If this stuff's true, if God's so glorious and praiseworthy, then let me intentionally take time to praise and glorify God. You can put that in the rhythm of your life, and that can help you move away from the power of sin to the glory of God. We have some stuff in our house. We have some paintings, some, some prayers put up. They're just little touch points so that instead of my eyes and mind going to sin, I can say, oh, wait, there's God. He's glorious. Oh, wait, I can remember the work of Christ. There's, there's infinite moments where we can just point to him and praise him. And one, one other action we could take. When, when you're tired, when you're cranky, when you're frustrated, when things aren't going well, you can be reminded of God's glory and his love for you, and you can take an opportunity to do something good for someone else. I've been trying to do that a bit more, realizing when I want to sin, realizing when I just want to be selfish and be done and, and take time to do this thing for me, but there's an opportunity to go and love somebody else. When you take that opportunity to go and love somebody else or serve somebody else or help somebody else, that's a step of walking in the way of Jesus. Jesus sees that. Jesus sees you moving to his glory. When, when, when your old self would have said, no, 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 I'm done. The power of God that's greater than the power of sin in your life can move you to keep moving forward and doing something good. What will you do with this? How will you act? How could you change? We could decide to do that. And last, tell. Paul shared these words to the church in Rome so that these words would be shared, so that the families there, the friends there, would take those words and share them with coworkers, to share them with children, to share them with all around. Those words were copied and shared and shared and shared and shared. We have this today because others have told us. What did you hear today that you could tell others? Here's what I want to tell you before we're done, because here's what I don't want you to miss no matter what. And maybe you could take some of this and tell others. Here's what I want you to know that I see in this passage that I, I just want to make sure you're told. You are made to participate and share in the glory of God. You're made for that. That's good and awesome. Sin ruins that. It strips us all of that. It strips our friends and families of that. It pulls us away from glory and into worthlessness. But God is bigger and stronger and mightier. And when you're unfaithful, he remains faithful. And when you're in sin, his grace is greater than all of your sin. And he is always more powerful than the power of sin. And that has been proven through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is the good news. Christ is Savior, Lord, and King. He has authority and power. He has crushed and vanquished sin. And you don't need to live in sin any longer. He has done what it takes to redeem you from that power. He has done what it takes to pay the price for that sin. He has become sin so that you can have his righteousness and return into his glory. 
That is good news. I want you to know that. And I want you to tell other people that. If you're not sure you believe it, go tell other people it anyway. See if they believe it and talk about it. And we can place our faith in him. And he'll give us his spirit and soften our heart and renew our mind. And he'll bring us back to the glory we're made for. So that we can begin to pursue him and know him and love like him and live for the purposes he has for us. Everyone's a sinner except this guy, Jesus. Put your faith in him. Run from the power of sin and run to him. Here's one action we can take right now. We're going to spend time in praise and worshiping God. If half of what I said is remotely true today, the right response is to praise and glorify God. We're going to take time to praise and to pray, which are really two sides of the same coin. As we stand and worship God together um, and sing these songs together as a response to what we've heard, there's opportunity and space to pray. And there'll be some folks up here. Pastor Russ will be up here uh, and Eloise and some others will be up here. If, if there's an action you want to take or something on your heart or a change you want to make or somebody you want to tell, you can come on down and be prayed for. If there's some burden in your life or something you're struggling with or, or some sin you're wrestling with and you'd like somebody to pray with you, there's people up here to pray with you. If you don't know what you need to pray for, but you want someone to sit with you and pray with you, there's space for prayer for you during this time. If you have a friend next to you who brought you, and you're like, can you pray for me? You can stay where you are and pray with that friend. If after the service, you can grab the people up front and say, hey, I, I want to pray through this. We're available to pray with you. I invite you to stand with me now. We're going to close with a time of worship and song and there is space for prayer for you. And I want to read this prayer, and then we're going to move right in to worship through song. O love of God, whose will it is that all created spirits would live everlasting in pure and perfect fellowship with you. Grant that in our life today, right now, we do nothing to defeat this gracious purpose. Let us keep in our minds how thy whole creation groans, waiting for the perfect appearing of the sons of God. Let us now welcome every influence of your spirit upon our lives, that we may more speedily make for that end. When you knock at our heart's door, let us not keep you standing, but welcome you with joy and thanksgiving. Let us harbor nothing in our heart that might embarrass thy presence. Let us keep no corner of our hearts closed to your influence. Do what thou will with us, O God. Make of us what thou will, O God. Change us as thou will, O God. Use us as thou will, O God. Lord, help us understand your glory and grace. Move us from the power of sin into your presence. We thank you and praise you through the work of your Son, our Lord and Savior and King, Jesus Christ, amen. Let's worship together.